Hello there guys, RMP792 here. Sorry this video is a day late. Um, actually, a couple of days late, theoretically. Um, when I originally said I would talk about you know, the last episode of Discovery on Monday, I completely forgot it was the Easter weekend and I was away. Uh, so yeah, I spent the, uh, the weekend in York. I might make a video just talking about what I did there because, well, the, the art of the Dawnsy was always a fun shindig and I'm in a lot of pain right now as a, as a result of it, so you know. Seriously, Edwardian Jiu-Jitsu bends you in interesting ways. But anyway. So, the big finale of Star Trek Discovery Season 2. It was good. Had some negatives. It's a lot like this season overall, in that it had lots of individual great moments, and a lot of the bending they had to do to get to those moments kind of annoyed me. Um, so I want to talk first about the actual battle itself. Um, not a fan. Because, okay, here's the thing. The effects department on this show are really goddamn good at what they do. Like, like ludicrously good. I do not know how they make this show look this pretty on a TV budget. You know, it's either got a ridiculously big budget, or it's or the, or the team doing it are seriously underpaid. But the the actual theoretical battle, the, the, the effect work on the battle itself was really, really good. But because I think there was too much garbage flying around during it. You know, all those drones and shuttlecraft and, and you know, construction pods and everything else meant that most of the time what I actually wanted to see was being obscured. I wanted to see the Discovery and the Enterprise standing side by side, of, or flying side by side, and fighting together. And a lot of the time, the action was instead focused on you know, all those drones and everything else flying about. And yeah, there was some really nice you know, nerdgasm moments, like when the Klingons turned up and you know, about half a dozen D7 battlecruisers drop out of warp and open fire, and it's like, yes, D7 battlecruisers, thank you! I've been waiting for those things. Um, you know, and, and things like that. And... Yeah, as a result, the battle was too messy to actually follow. Um, you know, and, and again, we've never seen Star Trek do battle that way in terms of, you know, even the, you know, the, even the battles in um, Deep Space Nine were between full-size starships. I mean, the smallest thing they had in those battles were about runabout-sized ships, which are about twice the size of the average shuttle. Um... And that was about the smallest thing they put into those big battles. The rest of it was full-size starships, which actually made the battles easier to follow, because even though you were you know, throwing hundreds of starships at each other, they were big, they were recognisable, and, and everything looked you know, really good and really pretty. And again... The... See, I think this battle would have been a lot more enjoyable for me if they'd stripped all of that out, and it had just been you know, the Enterprise and the Discovery fighting... <clears throat> I beg your pardon, you know, standing side by side against a, a fleet of Section 31 ships. Because again, they're outnumbered by, what, 30-ish to 1? You know, at the beginning, or 30-ish to 2, rather, at the beginning of the fight. You know, that, that's an interesting battle. You didn't need to clutter it up so much. Um, which also meant that things like uh, the moment when Spock and Michael leave the Discovery, you know, her in the Red Angel suit, him in a shuttlecraft trying to cover her, again... There was enough garbage flying around in this in in that sequence that it got a little distracting. I would have preferred to have just her, or you know, or just her and Spock, you know, out there. And again, you want obstacles for them to go past and, and stuff to get in the way, but you want that to be more you know bits of debris or or things like that rather than having you know, all these shuttles flying around her. So that was my big complaint about the battle sequence. It it felt overly busy. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, personally, I'd have stripped all that out, focused just on the two, you know, the two capital ships, you know, and again, if you want to make it, you know, a little more interesting, yeah, Section 31 has lots of ships of various sizes in this battle, you know, so, you know, maybe, you know, so, so they actually do achieve some mission kills, because again, you know, the Enterprise is a big, well-armed ship, because it's a, it was intended for independent operation, 
you know, on the Discovery, you know, had some major retrofits as a result of the war, so it's actually quite well armed for its size. Though admittedly, they seem to be showing the Discovery is about the same size as the Enterprise, which given that the Discovery is meant to have about a quarter of the crew, I find odd. But again, the Enterprise is meant to be, relatively speaking, quite crammed with personnel, because again, they didn't know what the hell they were going to need on a long-distance exploration mission. Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, so, I'll be honest, most of this episode is the giant battle sequence. And intercut throughout that are what each you know individual person does during the battle. And that's absolutely fine. You know, so you've got, you know, Michael and uh, Stamets and, and um, the engineer. Uh, her name is apparently Jet. Um, they said it a couple more times in this episode, so I can now remember it. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, so Michael and Stamets and Jet, um, you're all, are all, you know, and, and Spock are all struggling to get the, uh, the Red Angel suit built for her. Um, which is all well and good. Again, it's always nice to see the tech nerd, you know, side of Starfleet fixing stuff. Um, and, and you've, again, I'm really liking the engineer. I'm glad she's, she's with them now going forward because she's a fun character. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so they get the Red Angel suit built and then, you know, there's a bit of an explosion in one of the corridors. So, uh, Stamets gets injured and has to get taken to sick bay. And it was fairly obvious at that point that, um, you know, Colville was going to be there and they'd have a little bit of a reconciliation. Um, so Stamets is clearly quite badly hurt. Uh, but again, major battle sequence, and we really need to find whoever it is in the Starfleet construction yards that keeps putting explosives behind all the consoles, because whoever they are, they're a dick. Actually, do you want to know the in-canon reason for why Starfleet consoles explode? It's because Starfleet uses ionized plasma as a power source for all its consoles. I'm not even joking, that's the actual in-canon reason, or it used to be, I don't know if they changed it, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with a plug, guys? Anyway, um, but yeah, so, you know, and again, there's quite a few nice individual moments in this episode, but I think one of the problems is last week was front-loaded with all the really emotional scenes so that they could get everybody where they needed to be for the end of the season and this episode was the big blow-up finale i think what they should have and as a result this actually felt a little stretched in places um what i'd argue might have been better is either doing this episode and the last episode together um as you know like an hour 15 episode um, rather than two 40, you know, 40, 50 minute episodes. Or um, swapping around the order of a lot of scenes so that some of the goodbyes and, and moments that happened in the last episode actually happened here in the midst of the battle, which I appreciate might not work as well because, you know, obviously, middle of the battle, you've got stuff to do. So, you know, I... I... I feel like there's a slightly better way to handle it than they did. Um, but again, that could partially be because these were two individual episodes. And this is listed as um, part one and part two. So I have a feeling that if I watch them together back to back, they might feel a little better than they do as individual episodes. Again, that's often a problem two parters have so uh you know i'll have to see at some point in the future when i uh when i rewatch this season and i will rewatch this season this was a good season overall and I'll, I'll talk about the season as a whole um yeah once I've, I've talked about the episode um but yeah so we also find out that yes michael is indeed the one who sent the signals and each signal was designed specifically to get something for that battle, something that they needed in order to successfully get the discovery through the portal and thus defeat control. Um, you know, so the first one was uh, they needed uh, Jet, they needed the engineer because she, you know, is really a good engineer and they just needed her. Um, you know, the second one uh, was to Terralysium, which is where they're going, or where they're planning on going anyway. Um, the third was... Oh, what the hell was the third one? Was the third one Kamenar? No, not Kamenar. Suri's home. Was that Kamenar? I can't remember. 
Um, yeah, the third one was Saru's homeworld because um, Saru's sister actually turns up in the middle of the fight with a bunch of uh, Ala, you know, with some ships that clearly pinched off the local, um, you know, alien despots, uh, which is that's all well and good. That that's you know, it's a nice moment. You know, and uh, as I said, Ash turns up allied, you know, with a bunch of allied Klingons at the same time, which. And, and there's the brilliant line with the same, we're sending you tactical data on these ships now, and I'm just thinking, uh, guys, those are Starfleet ships you're fighting, you know, you're sending tactical data on Starfleet ships to the Klingons. Okay. <sighs> but, uh, yeah, because, um, you know, the Klingons ain't, ain't trustworthy yet. You know, it's, it's, it's a while before uh, the Federation and the Klingons, well, the, the, their Cold War simmers down into an actual alliance and a relationship. Um, it, it literally takes one of their moons exploding before that happens. Uh, uh, I, I love Star Trek VI. Star Trek VI is my favourite Star Trek film. I'm not even going to argue that it's the best. I, it's just my favourite for some reason. No clue why. Um, but, uh, yeah. And so, you know, all, all throughout this, we also have the stuff that's going on on the Enterprise. Um, you know, you've got Pike being a captain, being in command, doing, you know, doing all of his, his commanding stuff. And yeah, I like uh, Anson Mount as Pike. He's genuinely good at it. You know, I've quite, um, I've enjoyed uh, number one in her limited appearances. And at this point, it, it basically became a, a joke in this episode. The fact that, yeah, we still don't know what her name is. You know, to the point where when she's getting, you know, at the end of the episode, when um, the Enterprise crew is getting questioned by... Um, Starfleet, or, or you know, some some senior person in Starfleet. You know, is you know, name number one. So again, the, one of the things that uh, a friend of mine keeps saying he really, really wants is a show about you know Pike and Spock on the Enterprise at this period, at this point in the timeline. Um, you know, and he, he's kind of slightly convinced that they might be thinking about it, given how much money they clearly put into building that you know the Enterprise set. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. You know, I, again, bits of this episode, especially at the end, did feel like they were testing the waters in a let's see what the fan reaction to this is kind of way. Um, and I wouldn't be opposed to it. Again, I always think prequels have inherent problems um, that are invariably very difficult to circumvent. You know, Enterprise ran into a lot of problems as a result of it being a sequel. The prequel, this ran into a lot of problems as a result of it being a prequel. Um, so... I'm certainly not opposed to the idea, um, and if they do do that, I don't know how they can maintain the, you know, what is number one's actual name thing throughout an entire show, but honestly, I'd like to see him try, because I think that will be funny. Um, you know, unless that is actually her real name, but, you know, maybe she just had cruel parents. Uh, but yes, so, um, yeah, it's it's... So, so the Pike stuff is mostly good, and partway through the episode, um, a torpedo lodges itself in the Enterprise's hull. Um, you know, and if it goes off, it's going to blow out, you know, like four decks and about half the saucer section. Uh, so, you know, um, Admiral Cornwall, who's a psychiatrist, I would like to remind you, do, do you not have an ordnance tech? You know, so somebody who's actually trained to disarm photon torpedoes? No? Okay. Um, and number one, go up to, to uh, you know, see if they could disarm it. And, of course, they can't. And, you know, there's a big manual close-the-door lever. But, of course, it's on the inside because everybody in Starfleet design is a moron. Seriously, why is there not an emergency manual close lever on both sides of the emergency bulkhead, you morons? Anyway. Um, but, yeah. So, of course, uh, Admiral Cornwell ends up sacrificing herself. Um, while and Pike watches, and again, the principle of the the principle of the scene is fine. The actors are giving excellent performances. The fact that Pike is completely fine behind that not very thick door from a photon torpedo blast is kind of ludicrous. Um, especially when you see the damage that actually gets done to the Enterprise as a result of that blast. You know, it, it does blow out a chunk of the saucer section, a fairly big chunk. So the fact that, you know, that closing that one door was, was enough to save Pike was completely stupid. Um, 
Yeah, no, no other way to, to phrase that. So yeah, again, I like the principle of Cro of Cornwell sacrificing herself that way. The execution needed more thinking through. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm I okay. If I was going to do it, I'd have made it a deliberate parallel to Pike's ultimate fate, the fate that he now knows is coming. I'd have basically have her deliberately go into some sort of radiation-filled area in order to, I don't know, reroute power or something. Or yeah, there's always a techno battle reason you can come up with um, that in some way saves the ship. But, you know, she gets massive radiation poisoning and, and dies pretty much there. And that's what gives Pike his kind of mild PTSD thing. To, to you know, So, again, it's reminding him the fate he knows is coming. Um, you know, and, and then, and again, once, you know, he gets the call from Spock, he snaps out of it and he goes back to, back to doing what he has to do. You know, to get his people, or as many as, of his people as he can, out there alive. Um... So that's how I would have done it personally. So yeah, it was a, again, good moment, but without the right stuff around it. Um, so yeah, it, it that's kind of, again, that really does sum up this season as a whole. But anyway, um, and yeah, so the other main thing, of course, is, is Michael and Spock saying their, their big, you know, tearful farewell. Um, you know, and, 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 and Michael basically telling Spock that he needs to find somebody, you know, he, he needs to find, you know, the, the yin to his yang sort of thing. And I'm thinking, so she's talking about Kirk there, right? Because, yeah, there's a reason why Slash Freak Riders like, Sp like uh, Spock and Kirk. But, uh, um, no, because again, yeah, the reason that Kirk and Spock work so damn well together is that they are, in that sense, a marriage of opposites. You have the impulsive hothead who improvises like nobody's business and the logical planner, you know, thinking ahead person, you know, who, who you know, again, there is a reason why Kirk is sometimes able to beat Spock at chess. You know, Spock is the better technical player, but, but Kirk is able to improvise and adapt really, really efficient, you know, really, really effectively and really, really well. And again, that's why they, they work together so damn well. So, yeah, that, that's clearly what Michael was talking about there. And, uh, yeah, and the actual sequence of, of Michael travelling through you know, various points in the recent past to send the signals is really, really pretty. You know, again, visual effects department on this show, you are really goddamn good at your jobs. Um, you know, I don't know if it's just the, the sheer advances that have been made in, in you know, CGI technology over the last few years, but, you know, between... This, um, The Expanse is another sci-fi show that looks really, really good. Um, what else have we had recently that's been really pretty on TV? I feel like we must have had more. You know, we need more, we need more space opera on TV, guys. Somebody make some more space opera. Um, but no, it's, it's been really pretty this season. I mean, it was really pretty last season, but it's, it's really pretty this season. Um, but yeah, so, um, yeah, they, they eventually manage to you know, open up the big wormhole of doom and they fly through it. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, um, the ship gets boarded by Leland, uh, who, you know, basically goes around the ship shooting at people. And so Giorgio and the new security officer go and have a, a gravity flipping fight in the corridor with him, which again, very pretty, but you could have cut it out the episode. Um, and then she eventually gets him into... Uh, the the spoil cube, uh, which she somehow magnetizes, and that's enough to rip all the nanites out of him, and and in some way defeats him, and thus shuts down control. Which again, that that's that's putting your eggs in one basket, eh, Mister AI. I would have liked to think you'd be a lot smarter than that. Um, so yeah, so so that basically causes all the control ships to shut down right before they fly through the the uh, wibbly wobbly time portal. Um, yeah. I was figuring they'd have to do something like that because otherwise, you know, even if it doesn't get the sport, the sport data control is still in control of too many things to, to be easily stopped. So that felt like a bit of a cop out. That that to me was, you know, oh, if we blow up the control ship, you know, all of the, all of the 
you know, the battle droids shut down. Um, you know, or, or you know, end of the Avengers, where closing the portal and blowing up the ship causes all the Chitauri to keel over dead. Again, it feels like limiting story potential going forward. Um, and as I said, I was really surprised Giorgio ended up being on the Discovery, given that, you know, again, she is supposedly getting her own show where she's in charge of Section 31. Um, whereas at the end of the episode, they basically offer the job to Ash, uh, which could mean that, you know, maybe they saw all the, all the fans saying, no, this, this, is about, this seems like a bad idea to us, and thought, hmm, maybe not. Um, maybe they were just lying to us from the ground up about that even being a thing. Um, you know, or maybe they you know, are intending her to have her own show, but it's going to be you know, in the same point in the future the discoveries now. Who knows? We don't know. Um, but yeah, so so goodness knows what's going to happen there. Um, and again, Giorgio... <sighs> I miss Captain Giorgio. I really do. You know, Empress Giorgio to me is just less interesting because there's only so much... Moral complexity and moral grayness are interesting. Evil is fun in short bursts. And let's be honest, she's still evil. You know, everything she does is is, is primarily in her own self-interest or as a result of her weird obsession with, with Michael. Um, you know, so... No, again, I, I miss Captain Giorgio. Uh, but yes, and of course we get the the you know, the tie up for uh, the season with you know the Enterprise crew and and you know Spock suggesting that everybody who knows about Discovery and her spore drive you know, must be sworn to absolute secrecy, so nobody's allowed to talk about it, and they won't make any records, and that's why it's never been mentioned before in Star Trek. <sighs> yeah, I'm not a fan of that. Um, So, so yeah, overall, basically good episode with some stuff in it that bugged me. Um, which, again, that, that's pretty common for this season of Star Trek. Um, you know, stuff I liked. You know, the actual visual effects of the space battle were really good. There was lots of good moments within it. Um, you know, have it, having um, the, you know, the Klingons turn up, uh, you know, that, that was a bit of a nerdgasm moment. So, yeah. There was, there was good, fun stuff here. Um, but... Yeah. So, yeah. Overall, it was good. But I feel like a, you know, a couple of couple of runs over the script you know, for a few minor tweaks to some situations, I think would have made it better. Um, that That's just my personal take. So, Season 2 of Discovery as a whole massive improvement over season one it was a lot more fun it was a lot lighter it actually felt a lot more star trek in places and pike was a much more enjoyable captain than Lorca. the Lorca was in many ways a more interesting character until his big revelation where you realize what's been going on and you just you know, smack your head into your hand and go oh for christ's sake um so yeah it was much more enjoyable as a season with the caveat that the, my overall feeling for this season is it feels like the creative team came in at the beginning of this season and went oh boy the, the, the premise for this show is kind of tying us into a massive knot of loopholes and contradictions and, and hamstrings we're going to have to fix all of this bollocks aren't we and that's what they said about doing so why doesn't Starfleet use the hologram things in the future? Because they broke the Enterprise. You know, why doesn't anybody remember the Discovery? Because they got sent to the future and everybody agreed never to talk about them for security reasons. Why doesn't Starfleet use the Spore Drive in the future? Repeat the previous answer. Um, you know, how do we avoid making more continuity problems in the future? We shove Discovery through a time portal far into the future. So, this entire season has felt like one big course correction uh, between season one and whatever they want season three to be. And I'm not strictly speaking opposed to it, but it does always feel a bit off whenever a show decides it needs... You know. 
I get the need to address your problems, but I feel like they went too far. Um, in a, Again, this is a similar sort of thing to the way that Enterprise was really floundering for its first couple of seasons. And then at the end of season two, they had you know, Earth get attacked by this mysterious probe. And then all of season three is them going and finding out why the hell that happened, where it came from, you know, um, who sent it, what the hell's going on there. And you've got this big season-long arc uh, regarding the Zindi. And that's that was, you know, again, that was, whoops, our, our direction is crazy. You know, our, our show is floundering. We need to change a direction. Let's go that way. And this very much feels like the same thing, except Enterprise did all of that set up in one episode. Discovery's taken an entire season to do it. And again, I'm not opposed to that, but it always feels a bit odd in that regard. Um, but yeah, so Discovery Season 3 has a lot of potential to do very interesting things because um, we know that this piece of time travel technology isn't necessarily the most reliable, so whether or not they actually get where they're going, who knows, because we don't see them arrive. So it is entirely possible that they'll end up somewhere completely different from where they ended, from where they wanted to go, which was Terralisium 910 years in the future, I believe, uh, which would make it the early 30... would make it about the early 3160s, I believe. No, 3168, um, based on when in the timeline Discovery is meant to be taking place. Which would actually be the fur pretty much the furthest forward point in the Star Trek timeline we've seen. Um, I can't remember explicitly, but I think we have technically seen further in the episode Living Witness of Voyager, um, where which is set in an alien museum, and it's set a couple, it's set several hundred years after Voyager visited their planet, um, and you know they have historical recreations of Voyager, and they end up with the the backup EMH, which is a thing that will be really useful for Voyager to have that they never have anywhere else, but anyway. Um, and the Doctor basically points out that their historical simulations are really inaccurate because you know, they are basically pronouncing Voyager to be the bad guys in this situation. You know, that Because they're throwing around biogenetic weapons and everything else. And everybody's, all the cast are clearly having fun playing evil versions of themselves. It's great. Um, and then the, fin the final scene of that episode is basically you know, by forcing them go to confront the truth of what really happened the doctor actually eventually after you know, more years of struggle and strife did effectively make that civilization better by you know making them face up to their own prejudices and eventually become you know a, a better people um and that last sequence is again a them watching a historical reconstruction of what happened um, very, very far in the future. And I think that's the furthest point in the, time, in the Star Trek timeline we've seen up to that point. But again, that's way in the Delta Quadrant. So, you know, they presumably haven't encountered the Federation, or maybe they have, we don't know. Um, so, And I think we might be going even further than that if they do go the full 910 years into the future. So, goodness knows what's going to be going on there. Um, because... Here's the thing, by that point in the timeline, I mean, let's face it, it was the, what, 27, 2800s that Daniels was from in Enterprise? And at that point, Starfleet are basically Time Lords. You know, that they, they, we see a time ship from the future that's dimensionally transcendental. You know, it looks like a, it's about the size of a small shuttlecraft, but inside, you know, you can open up a hatch that, that drops down like 30 meters. You know, and it's just like, wait, what? You know, and, and uh, things like that. Um, so, you know, and they've got, you know, time travel technology so advanced that you can literally walk through a door and be in a completely different room, um, or be in a completely different time zone. I mean, th again, there's a bit in uh, one season three episode where, um, Daniels recruits them to go onto, you know, uh, what was it at the time, effectively present day Earth. And he basically just, you know, says, go into your briefing room. They step into the briefing room and suddenly they're on, you know, you know, early 2000s Earth. Um, and, yeah, that... You know, so, if that's what they had in, like, the 2700s, God only knows what they would have by, you know, the, the 3100s. Um, the other possibility I can see them doing 
is they arrive after the, after the Federation has, for some reason, fallen. I can genuinely see them doing that. Um... So I have two schools of thought on that. One of which is the logical storyteller's perspective, and one of them is the pure emotional Star Trek fan's perspective. From the pure logical storyteller's point of view, going to a future after the Federation has fallen gives you a lot of room to manoeuvre and, and do interesting stuff and tell interesting stories. Um... Again, there's a reason why I actually really like the first couple of seasons of uh, Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. Um, which, if you haven't seen it, the entire premise of that show is basically um, they have this interstellar alliance known as the Commonwealth, uh, which is clearly a sort of Federation-type thing. You know, with lots of different alien species working together for the benefit of all, benefit of all yada, yada, yada. Um, and they get betrayed by one of their own members, a group of genetically engineered humans called the Nietzscheans, who basically follow the philosophies of Frederick Nietzsche. Um, and there's a massive, massive war. And the ship, the Andromeda Ascendant, is in the first battle of that war, and it's getting absolutely, you know, it's getting hammered. Um, so in order to effectively get clear, because it gets ambushed, basically, um, in an attempt to get clear, it basically tries to, you know, the, the captain orders all hands to abandon ship and attempts to loop around a black hole. And because one of his crew members is a Nietzsche and you know, they end up having a firefight on the bridge, um, everything goes to hell in the handbasket and they end up getting stuck in the event horizon of the black hole and frozen in time for about 300 years. And then they eventually get they get pulled out by a salvage ship in 300 years' time, by which time the Commonwealth has completely fallen apart as a result of you know, the war and, and just everything else that happened. So And you know, the, the captain of the ship basically decides, okay... I need to rebuild the Commonwealth. And that's the entire premise of the show, is that you know, he is trying to put together, or put back together, this vast galactic, well, transgalactic, actually, it's spread over about three galaxies, um, you know, union that he genuinely made everybody's lives better. And everything, and you know, they've kind of fallen into a bit of a dark age since then. Your know, technology has actually regressed, which means that his you know, swanky warship is actually one of the most advanced starships in the galaxy now, or the galaxies now. And it's actually a, it's a good setup to tell stories, and they did tell some interesting stories in the first couple of seasons before the show went to shit. But anyway, that's not relevant. But I could see them doing something very similar with Discovery. So, you know, Discovery has the spore drive, which gives them the ability to jump around a lot in the galaxy. And, you know, they... And I could see them attempting to, you know, do something where they attempt to rebuild the Federation, you know, and, and do the sort of thing that Enterprise started to do quite well in its last season and show, you know, and sh you know it was showing the, the first foundation of the Federation, of, of, build, of building those blocks. And I could see Discovery effectively trying to do something similar with them trying to rebuild it. Um, but on the other hand... As somebody who loves Star Trek, on a purely emotional level, the Federation is a dream. It really is. The Federation is the society that I want to live in. Or the, the idealised version of the Federation is the society I want to live in. One where, you know, it's completely post-scarcity. You need something, you can have it. You know, you want something, yeah, we can probably get that for you too. You know, and... People do stuff, are able to do things not because they have to in order to live. They can do stuff because that's what they want to do. You know, like um, J uh, Benjamin Sisko's father runs a restaurant. And he runs that restaurant because he likes cooking. He likes knowing that people are, are eating and enjoying his food. And he likes being very sociable. You know, he's, he's a restaurant owner who walks around, you know, waits on tables personally, chats to the customers, you know... You know, sort of recommends particularly good things from the menu that he thinks are, are, are good that day. And, you know, he doesn't particularly like replicated ingredients where he can avoid them. So my thought is that he almost certainly gets, you know, his supply of, of fish and various other things from local fisher people who fish because they like fishing and are quite happy to, you know, hand over the, their catch of the day to the man who, yeah, to a man who will cook them really, really well. You know, so, 
the Federation, if I'm honest, couldn't exist in the real world. That's kind of why it's important for it to be there in fiction. Um, you know, Roddenberry himself was a, a very flawed individual. You know, he, he'd like to preach a lot of this stuff while doing all sorts of sneaky things to make himself a load of money. Um, like, uh, you know the uh, theme tune to uh, the original series? Did you know that has lyrics? And I'm not talking about the the you know the ooh you know the oohs and the ahs and all that stuff. No, it actually has lyrics that were written for it by Gene Roddenberry, not because he ever intended for them to be used, but purely so that he could take a cut of uh, the royalty checks for the theme. Yeah, it was a dick move on Roddenberry's part, and yeah, Roddenberry was kind of a dick sometimes, but he created an idealized society that I wish we lived in. So yeah, so on a fundamental level, I don't want to see the fall of the Federation. But I understand the storytelling potential it could give. <sighs> yeah, that, that went somewhere. So, Season 2 of Discovery was a major improvement. I'm hoping they can continue to improve as they go into Season 3. I'm hoping that the freedom that they're granted by by going into the future gives them a lot of, you know, lets them tell some interesting stories. Um, you know, for example, you know, what would Discovery look like if it got major upgrades with, um, you know, say, 27th century tech? That could be interesting to see. Or, you know, are, are they going to effectively try and start their own, you know, mini federation out in uh, the far base quadrant with, uh, you know, or based around Terralesium. You know, how has Terralesium evolved in, in the best part of a millennium? You know, maybe they're going to have their own mini federation or, or something like that. And and again, there there's a lot of things you can do here. And I am very, very curious to see what they do, where they go with it. There's just a lot, a lot of potential here. But yeah. <sighs> So yeah, I think that's all I've got. Uh, this is the best part of 40 minutes long. So thank you all very much for watching uh, these uh, Discovery Vlogs. There's a very good chance I'll keep doing them once we once Season 3 comes out, um, but that won't be for a while. Uh, I am going to be continuing my uh, you know, hypothetical DCEU series, but that's not going to be until next week. Um, and I'm hoping to go and see Avengers Endgame tomorrow. Uh, it, you know, it, it comes out here on effectively Wednesday night, Thursday morning. Um, I'm not going to go to a midnight screening or anything crazy like that because I can't be asked, and I don't have a friend who works at the cinema anymore. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's... So, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to attempt to go to a fairly early screening on Thursday morning, and you'll probably get and so hopefully you'll get my thoughts on it either tomorrow or pr more likely friday you know um you know if i get back you know if i if i do manage to get into that i think it was about a 9 30 screening i was thinking of going to um which yeah you know, the, the first one of the day basically i figure if i can make it to that screening uh then i should get home like two o'clock ish um, and, you know, I might record something then. More likely it'll be Friday morning when I've had time to actually you know, process my thoughts and, and think on and, and, you know, and go from there. So, yeah, so I will definitely talk about Endgame once I've seen it. Um, hoping to see it tomorrow if, you know, it's completely chocker, which I doubt purely because, A, work day, no matter how many people are skiving off, um, and, B, there's, like, 20 showings i should be able to get into at least one of them and uh yeah so that is all i've got on discovery so um yeah here's to more star trek here's hoping it'll be good and uh yeah thank you very much for watching and i will see you in future videos